Well, welcome Lord Heseltine, Michael. You have a vast experience over the past 70 years as one of the most influential statesmen. Looking back over that time, uh, how has politics changed and what position do you feel we're in at the moment? I, I don't think politics ever does change. I mean, I think, read Shakespeare, and every piece of devious behaviour, every plot, it's all there. All the weaknesses of human beings, he parodies it brilliantly. So I've never taken a view that there's something new about politics. You're dealing with human nature, and by and large, that's a, a very encouraging and exciting thing to think and be experienced by. Of course, there are the, the exceptions, and they're the ones who get the headlines and often create the public impression. But they are, fortunately for all of us, a very small part of the total. So um, I'm hesitant about uh, seeing something different about the present circumstance. Of course, the challenges are different. Because of course society evolves and uh, different problems emerge. And today, I think, I think the great change. Well, the the, the big the, the this is the most extraordinary yeah. thing, because uh, I mean one of the big issues today across the world is immigration, and you know, understandably, in recent years, people have felt pretty cheesed off because their living standards at best have remained static and people quite understandably hoped things are getting better and they haven't been getting better and so you they look for people to blame the bbc the civil servants but at top of the list immigrants and the problem is going to get worse for the simplest of reasons because whilst we may have our anxieties about our relative underperforming living standards, literally billions of people have got one of these and they can see how we live. They're not crooks, they're not evil people. In the main, they're relatively young people who say, well, I want to share the action. I, I've got my own life to live, I've got children and dependents and I'm going to try and get them into this totally different world that now represents what we go, regard as the Western world. So they're going to keep coming. And global warming, what is it, 70 million people are going to be dispossessed by rising sea levels. Where are they going to go? And of course you can say they move a bit further inland, but once you start telling people to move, they understandably start saying, well, why don't I choose where to move to? So. The whole immigration issue, which is now increasingly toxic in democratic politics, is in its infancy compared with what we are, what generations yet to come are going to face. Is that a dismal message then for politics, or is there hope somewhere? Well, you know, you shouldn't be in politics unless you've got something called hope. I mean, what's the point? Um, I suppose you could say, well, things are pretty ropey and they're not likely to get much better, but at least I can try and help those who are in increasing trouble. But that would be a very depressing approach to life. And uh, certainly uh, it's uh, something that never occurred to me. Uh, there's a limit to what anyone can do and the circumstances are always very stretching. But there are things you can do and there are things that can help. And if you can be in a position and you have the ideas and, and, and above all the drive to pursue them, then you can have an extraordinarily exciting um, and I hope profitable life. But given our political situation where we have elections every four or five years and we have manifestos, uh, is it not the case that uh, we can't solve problems in four or five years so the discourse in politics, uh, the engagement we have with electorate has to change. Well, you know, you raise an important point about whether democracy can deliver uh, the perfect solution. And I think you're back with Churchill. It's not a good system until you look at all the others. And the great thing is that 
there are these temptations in the human psyche. Get power, hold it at any cost. And that's what people at the extreme do. And we've seen catastrophic consequences in my lifetime. <laughs> the Second World War is a classic example of that. But you can only got to look at uh, the problems going on in the Sudan or the problems we saw recently in Southeast Europe to realize that that nasty tendency of the accretion of power and the abuse of power is an element. And that is why democracy is such a vital protection. The people perhaps don't make sometimes the most sophisticated judgment, but they are a check on the abuse of power. And uh, I, I think that there is a priceless uh, connection between the need to consult the people and listen to the people and the exercise of power. Looking back over your long career, uh, you face many challenges and we can come on to some of those later on. But I know you have said that, that your legacy will be trees. <laughs> but what's your political legacy, you feel? Oh, well, uh, it has to be Liverpool. Liverpool changed me. There was no doubt in my mind. I started the regeneration in London. It was London and its derelict Docklands that really got me going. Um, and, and perhaps in terms of buildings, money spent, visible success, London is still the, the, the example I would choose. But it isn't. Because uh, 18 months after I had become involved in Liverpool, replicating what I'd been doing in London, they rioted. And... Toxteth. Uh, in Toxteth, the Toxteth riots. And mm -hmm. I, I said to Margaret, very interesting conversation, this actually, in terms of Margaret and her reputation. We're talking about Margaret Thatcher. We're talking about Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> sorry, yes. Um, look, I said, as Conservatives, we have to be completely on the side of law and order and the backing of the police and absolutely no question at all. But I, I think there's something more complex about these riots. And if you will let me, Prime Minister, I, I'd like to just say to my junior ministers, look, you look after the shop, I'm off to Liverpool. And uh, I arrived uh, and, and I didn't have any great agenda, except, as I had said to the Prime Minister, I want to get inside this thing. And um, so the first two or three days were welcoming. Very good to see you, Secretary of State. Of course, it's only the riots that brought you here, but anyway, here you are and you're listening and we like that, we appreciate that. And then, of course, inevitably, on day four, the journalist, they're always one of those in the back of the crowd. <laughs> Secretary of State, you've been here for four days. What are you going to do about it? Well, um, what had I found in those three days? And it was indelible in my memory. Everybody knew what was wrong. He was wrong, she was wrong, they were wrong. Everybody was wrong, except me. Mm -hmm. No one had any positive contribution to make about what they would do. So I was asked this question, what are you going to do about it? Well, I could have said, well, I'll go back and talk to my friends in London and I'll tell them what the problems are, but that didn't wash with me. And so I, I spent another couple of weeks going all round, looking for things that I thought could be done, which would actually show people that this atmosphere of decline and despair could be remedied and changed. And after my three weeks, I gave a press conference and I published a list of 30 projects that I said, look, let's start here. But the problem with that was, who was going to start? Because yeah, yeah. So for 18 months, once a week, I turned up at Liverpool. I had a task force from public and private sector. They did the hard slog all week. They had a notebook, a page, a project. Thursday night, we went through the notebook. Any trouble? I spent Friday trying to sort it out. And so what changed me? For the first time, 
I was involved personally in acute levels of poverty and despair, in acute examples of dereliction, in a, 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 a public environment of hopelessness. And I thought I better hang around and try and do something. And people have been generous. One of the most moving moments of my life, to be honest, was when the mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson at the time, came to see me in London and said, we'd like to give you the freedom of the city. This was a council of 60 Labour councillors <laughs> giving a Tory uh, of the freedom of the city. It brought tears to my eyes. I would like just to ask you a couple of questions in that, because when you went there, some of the news stories were the Prime Ministers wanting them out of the way. You know, he's going up to Liverpool. And by the way, this is an impossible job. So wh 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 why is he taking that on? But going from those stories to getting the freedom of the city from Labour people and sitting beside Joe Anderson uh, when you got it, how did you achieve that? Because politics is not easy. Politics is very difficult. And you seem to have shown the graft and the desire for engagement in listening to people, which in today's social media is missing that discourse of listening, engaging with people and understanding them. So give us a more insight into that. Yes, I think I can help you with that because if there's a problem about politics, it's two mountaintops. And, and the more articulate politicians get to the top of the mountaintops and bang on at each other. And their supporters follow the lead. So, you know, anything the Labour Party does is wrong. Anything the Tory Party does is wrong. The Lib Dems don't matter. They can't do anything. And that is the dialogue. And whatever comes up, it's coloured against that background. I had a list of 30 things in Liverpool that I thought needed to be done. And so uh, it was no use bringing Conservative Central Office and saying, well, how do I go about that? So the first question would be, who owns this piece of sand? Classically, it was a piece of derelict land. Who owns it? Find out, sit down. What do you want to do about this? Oh, well, the local authority won't give... I said, OK, we'll go and see the local authority together. Uh, you want some government money? OK, I, I, I have got a budget, I can help a bit, but I'm not going to spend money on this land unless we get somebody who will say, if you do this, I will do that. And um, so you've got a builder who said, yeah, if you clean that up, I'll build a house. Um, uh, and, but that, that is very technical. But something much more subtle happened because the people who came together no longer were shouting abuse at each other. Mm -hmm. They were looking at a piece of land and working out the technical problems of actually turning it into a green site and putting a house on it. And they became friends because they had a drink together in the pub at the end of the meeting. And so that process, which accelerated later on dramatically in a thing called City Challenge, brought together people who, in their traditional working mode, never met, never talked. They filled in forms, they had telephone calls, but they never sat there and said, look, we're all basically on the same side. This is Liverpool, we'd like to help. And once that happened, the human relationships changed. And I think I did play some part as a catalyst, yeah. but in the process, it made me realise of the huge potential there is in the devolution of power to the local communities of this country. Yeah, in fact, I was going to suggest to you that you acted as a facilitator and as a catalyst. But along with that, there was a human element to it as well, that you just get down to people as to what they felt, how you could move forward together. It wasn't you leading out front. It was you engaging with them and walking along with them with the problems. Would that be fair enough to say? Yes, but again, I've been extremely fortunate. Uh, I've had a, a number of interests and a number of careers. First of all, I started a business, uh, much of it in property. Secondly, I was a bird watcher and deeply involved in environmental culture. Um, and I came from South Wales, where we were a relatively prosperous middle-class family, 
but you couldn't drive very far without knowing that there was another world. And um, so all of these things did, I think, equip me. When we sat at the, these meetings, these endless meetings, I could talk to the property people yeah. as someone who knew what it was about, how to do it. I'd done it on a private scale. Um, uh, so I, I was equipped by my background for the process of facilitating. And I think my understanding coming from South Wales of the two nations did much influence me that, well, the most shocking thing that happened to me at Liverpool, and it, I was deeply shocked when some conservative supporter said, why are you bothering in there? There are no votes for us there. And I really am absolutely shocked that they should think like that. Absolutely. And in many ways, you have continued that journey. You, know, you did the urban development corporations. You, I think just in the past few weeks, they visited Teesside. And when we had the levelling up bill here, I actually predicted to my staff that you would come in. And they said, why? Because I said, he's the grandfather <laughs> of levelling up and devolution. So how much further do we need to go today in that to ensure, if you like, a UK-wide, uh, more harmonious engagement where we don't see London being exceptional? A long way. And this is the tragedy. If I could roll back and change history, I would go back to Redcliffe Maud's report of 1968, which the then Labour government commissioned. And basically, the report looked at the public administration at local level in this country, and it, it found out that there were 1,300 authorities. Uh, and why? Because historically, the pattern had evolved when the only means of getting anywhere was either by foot or horse. So you couldn't get very far, and therefore then you, was, you needed this proliferation of authorities to administer public welfare. Uh, Bedcliffe Maud looked at the 1,300, analysed the contemporary position of the 1960s, and said, you need 60. Uh, I, I was Peter Walker's junior minister uh, in the then 1970 government, which had to deal with this proposal. And the Conservative Party couldn't live with the abolition of the two tiers of too many Tory councillors, and it was too important a part of the political structure. But Peter managed to persuade them to take the 1,300 down to 300. And basically, that's where we are. Um, and we need 60. And if you have 60, by and large, you have identifiable units, the large cities, Bristol, Manchester, Liverpool, London, of course, Newcastle, uh, and you have counties. And that, that takes you to about 60 authorities. They're all different. They've all got different strengths and opportunities, different weaknesses, um, and they, by and large, attract a loyalty because people know that which county they're in and that sort of thing. And there's a, there's a regiment or there's a cricket team or whatever it may yeah, be. Yeah. Um, that is the building block upon which Redcliffe Maud said we should build a modern society. He was absolutely right. Now, so far, we've got to the point where we have now got mayors in most of the major conurbations and one or two missing, but by and large, we've made progress there but we've made very little progress in the uh, unification of the counties. Mm -hmm. One or two have, happened, have done it, but not that many. And uh, the politics, the party politics of doing something are extremely difficult. And how do I know? Well, uh, I have to tell you because in Scotland and Wales in the 1990s, I used primary legislation to get rid of all the two tiers. They're all unitary authorities now. And I was helped because there weren't many conservative councillors and so on the back benches of my party, there was little interest in the subject. Um, but in England, there was massive interest yeah. in the subject. Yeah. And so uh, the, the fact is we have not made enough advance. Now, if you could make advance, and you could, you could and should, then what you can do is to take the powers of London, which are all 
functionally divided housing, transport, education, skills, home office, whatever it may be, and they don't meet either. So when, when someone says to the home office, what's the problem about Liverpool? They will say, well, we're, we've got a chief constable and we're doing this and we're doing that. Well, that is an important part of Liverpool's problem. But what about the housing? What about the transport? What about the education and all of these other things? There is no coordinating process. So first of all, Whitehall has got to go back to the position where there are regional groupings of the Whitehall departments. It, secondly, it needs a central grouping under a senior cabinet minister of the relative departmental uh, uh, ministers. And thirdly, they then need to say to the elected mayor of the 60 authorities, you work out the strategy that is relevant to your area strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And we will work with you in partnership and we will mould the money that government can afford to meet your strategic vision. And that has a terrific effect. And the real tragedy is that every other capitalist economy in the world does it, except us. Yeah, yeah. It, when I uh, took up this position, my first visits were to Belfast, Edinburgh and Cardiff. And it was to bring people together to establish an informal inter-parliamentary group, which is now established here with House of Commons representative and House of Lords representative. And in the run-up to the Brexit internal market or whatever, the First Minister of Wales, in speaking to the Institute of Government, said that the House of Lords was really, really helpful. But this isn't rocket science. This is just bringing people together to understand them and, and to engage them. And I feel certainly, as one who comes from Scotland, that we could be in a foreign land in many ways in terms of people having, a re having other people's ears on that. Do we need uh, more of that engagement and, and to make it uh, more formal so that we can get a uh, UK-wide full engagement? I, I hesitate to, uh, especially to you, uh, uh, talk about Scotland and Wales. But my feeling is that the devolution arrangements have actually been devolution of Whitehall to Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast. And I, I, I don't think that's the right end product. I think that, again, it's not for me to work these things out, but um, Swansea, Cardiff, Mid Wales, North Wales, Pembrokeshire. You can do the same thing in, yeah. in Scotland, Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow, Dundee, Aberdeen, yeah. the Highlands. Um, and th th so th I think that devolving on within the devolved authorities yeah, would be a very exciting project. Absolutely. It I'm strictly non-political in this position, uh, so I'll no comment. But what I will do, I'll cite the comments of Professor James Mitchell of Edinburgh University, public policy expert, and he had an article in the Holyrood magazine a number of months ago stating that in many ways, in his opinion, Holyrood is a mirror image of Westminster in that we don't have that, that further uh, devolution element. Uh, so you have uh, people with the same views as yourself on that. Reform of the House of Lords is on the agenda, uh, whether it was the Conservative Manifesto 2019 or the report with Gordon Brown for the Assembly of the Nations and the Regions. If we're going to reform, what would you advocate for the House of Lords? Well, if I, you'd have to be Prime Minister to be in a position to uh, uh, drive such an agenda and I would not drive it at all. Because it's one of those wonderful things that if only we reform the House of Lords, but how and what will be the consequence? And basically, you couldn't invent the House of Lords. I mean, it, it's an <laughs> anachronism. It's part of our history. It's an evolution. It's where it is. But the moment you started to rationalise it, you'll end up with what? A second House of Commons? 
Is that really going to change anything? Mm -hmm. If you bring the bitterness of party politics into a second chamber, probably not coincidental in its electoral strategy with the two, with the existing one, so you get the blockage of changing power like you get in, in Congress. Um, and, and would it attract better debate? Uh, so I personally, because I can see where the momentum takes you, and I know it won't be any better and it won't solve anything, I would not myself commit the government I led to anything like the time-wasting uh, debates uh, that would be necessary to bring about a, an unpredictable change. Would you sanction incremental change? Well, there's been incremental change. I mean, we've seen the hereditaries down to a relatively small number. Uh, we've had the life peers introduced. Uh, it hasn't done anything to, to change public mind about these things. But the House of Lords has got one great strength, in my view, and that is that the debates are polite. They are often conducted by people who are real experts in their field, who do not actually subscribe to one party doctrine or another, who genuinely give their time because they have a com contribution to make. And because it's all in rather low key, the government can use it as a testing ground or admit when it got something wrong without a terrible sort of government defeated headline all over yeah, yeah. the place. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it is, it's, it's that the British constitution is a very sophisticated process. Nobody would create it if you started with a piece of paper and a crayon. But th that's not the point. It's what we've got. And before you change it, you should be very clear that what you're putting in its place is better and therefore more effective in delivering what people want. And I don't see what that would be. So you think the concept of a second chamber is really important in terms to keep a check on the main chamber? I think the second chamber does have the advantages of a more informed debate, a quieter debate, less publicity, and therefore the ability of governments to be more flexible in the way they decide policy. All of that is a plus. Going to a replica of the House of Commons, which in one way or another is what it would be, would, would not in fact enhance those attributes. Yeah. Well, we see the debt ceiling negotiations in Congress uh, and it went to the very edge yeah. as a result of that. And if someone was elected to the House of Lords, in my own mind, uh, I would envisage me going to a community hall and uh, people asking me what I'm going to do to repair the local school, to ensure we've got uh, more adequate facilities in the hospital, to fill in the potholes in the road. And if I said to them that, look, I don't take part in any financial debates, I'm sure, and you'd have heard this in Liverpool, well, what use are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, but you see, you've got to face it. The public don't like us. They don't trust us. They don't believe we're up to any good. What, you, what are they in it for? They're only in it for their own purposes. You know, Journalists, estate agents, and politicians. We do the public opinion testing. We're all at the bottom of the queue. Yeah. And I think we always have been. Um, and uh, uh, sadly, I, I, I don't see how that changes. Mm -hmm. But I understand why it's the case. Yeah. Because, you see, if you're a senior minister, the only decisions you're ever asked to make are those that nobody else can make. Yeah. So they're all controversial. And in the nature of human beings, if you agree with them and you do what they think is right, they think you're a good chap and they're well done and all that. If you disagree with them, they think you're an idle shirker who never listened, who doesn't give a damn, da 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 da. And every day you are making these decisions. And so you are accumulating an awful lot of enemies every day, let alone over a year or five years. Um, uh, but that's the the business you're in, you know. Yeah, but you need resilience as a politician. You need resilience. And you dem you've demonstrated that admirably. What I say, that's a very important point because young people say to me, I'm thinking of going into politics. I said, don't. 
If you're only thinking about it, don't. It's a tough, thankless, 24-7 career, and you will, in the end, you'll be kicked out. So you've got to have that determination and that tenacity and that conviction, and I hope the vision. Mm -hmm. When you were a minister, uh, perhaps you were irritated by the House of Lords holding up your legislation at times. Now that you're on the other side of the fence here, uh, is it real merit in being able to hold up legislation for a while? Yes, I, I had a, I now can't remember which, what it was, but I remember being absolutely furious with the House of Lords um, uh, over a piece of legislation that I was responsible for. And Peter Carrington, Lord Carrington, was the leader of the House of Lords at the time, or leader of the Conservatives in the House of Lords, perhaps. That would have been the case. And uh, so I came to see him and I said, look, this is intolerable. These unelected people are stopping the government's mandate and this thing. And you've got to, and I had some uh, wild scheme that I wanted him to pursue. And he said, Michael, we don't behave like that here. <laughs> 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 uh, and he was quite right. But, but yes, I mean, in the House of Lords, I don't myself play a big part. But on the big issues in which I have a, a, a voice and, and some experience, I, I value the opportunity to be able to uh, express it in the House of Lords. And, and certainly on Europe and on devolution, I have participated and will continue to participate. Absolutely. You know, your voice is still very strong here and people come in and they listen to you and understand. One of uh, your uh, former party colleagues who was a uh, cabinet minister, uh, is now in the House of Lords, and uh, when I asked him uh, what the difference between the House of Commons and the House of Lords was, he said, well, believe it or not, when I was in the House of Commons and I made speeches, nobody listened to me. But surprisingly, when I'm in the House of Lords and I make a speech, people come up and make comments and ask me about it. And maybe that's because of the length of time that people have been in politics, the lack of party political uh, confrontation here that I've described this place as many ways the best think tank in the country. I think you make an important point and I think that by and large in the Commons the speeches are about proposed legislation and they're relatively narrow in their focus and they're relatively partisan in their concept. Um, whereas in the Lords you have got such a wide range of experience, not just uh, from ex-politicians, but from people from a whole range of very important public and private sector uh, activities, that you are getting an expertise that you could never replicate in the House of Commons. Yeah, I, mean, I remember in the Brexit debate when we were talking about Article 50 uh, with Prime Minister Theresa May's proposals that a number of peers spoke about Article 50 and then Lord Kerr of Kinlochard stood up and says, well, I can tell you about Article 50 because I wrote it <laughs> and it was with this pen which I wrote it. You know, so you can't get experience like that. No, you uh, can't uh, replicate uh, elsewhere. that. No. But now, Lord Hesselton, you're uh, a non-affiliated peer and looking back at the political landscape, certainly when I... Uh, went into the House of Commons in 1987, there was an ideological element to our politics with Labour, working class, supporting workers, social justice, conservatives, uh, aspiring middle class people, business and law. With the social media, we now have identity politics to an extent. And it would seem to me that the ideological element has been lost in part uh, in place of the identity politics. You know, with say for example, Labour uh, voters now, what the polls would tell you is that there would be a preponderance of university educated individuals voting for Labour, millennials voting for Labour, the urban areas voting for Labour, whereas with the Conservatives you would have the, the rural areas uh, voting for it, and maybe a higher proportion of non-university people being in that. Now, I only cite what the opinion polls are seeing 
Is there a kernel of truth in that? If I may pick your first point up about me being an unaffiliated uh, uh, peer. I mean, this is funny. I make few claims myself, but in life, in the last 70 years, quite difficult to think of a big political battle in which I haven't been at the forefront on behalf of the Conservative Party. And so, and, and actually, I'm a member of the Conservative Party, and they're constantly writing and asking me for money. It's quite fun, you know. I, 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 I sent to the Scottish Conservatives because they've got a saner view about Brexit. But, uh, uh, but, but the idea that I am unaffiliated, I just find a joke of major scale. Um, uh, but on the, on the, uh, uh, the analysis that you put about the party changes, well, I think that... that, that I, I think this is probably about Brexit and f uh, frozen living standards. I think that Brexit is such a historic disaster that a large number of the sort of people who are involved in the world that is affected by Brexit have lost faith in the Conservative Party. Whereas a lot of people, particularly working class people in the red wall seats, still believe that their economic fortunes can be changed if the government changes because we got rid of the bureaucrats and the BBC and uh, the, the blob and all this other rubbish. Um, and, and they're learning the hard way um, uh, that, that they were deceived. Um, and my guess is that the Labour Party will make inroads uh, in, into that sort of constituency much less in the, uh, the, the, the constituency that is a Brexit, anti-Brexit orientated constituency. Yeah. Uh -huh. In one debate or one interview, you said that we have betrayed our young people. Given that we need hope in politics, and you reinforced that earlier in your conversation, what hope can we give young people at the moment? Uh, hope is very important. And yes, I have said we have betrayed a generation, and I believe it profoundly. The world is shrinking. A major reason why it's shrinking. But in my long political experience, time and again, I came across the role of government and the technological interface uh, that s sustains the industrial base. And I discovered very early on, first in space and then in defence industries, um, the enormous cash flow that central governments are providing to force feed the technological advance. Silicon Valley, good slogan, everybody likes it, we all want to be a sil Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the agency of the American defense budget and the space agency. Yeah. That's where the money comes from, on dramatic scale. Um, I, I can give you the figures, the Star Wars program, the screen that would stop enemy yeah, yeah. rockets. Ronald Reagan's team. Ronald Reagan, Star Wars. General Abrahamson in my office, $29 billion budget Secretary of State, and today, I could do a partnership with Harriet Watt University in Glasgow, who are at the leading edge in this technology, $100 million out of my $29 billion. I think he thought I would smile with appreciation. What I heard him say was, I've got $29 billion of taxpayers' money, and I know where every advanced technological adva base is taking place, and I'm going around all of them and then do partnerships, and all of it will go back into the American base, industrial base. China, that is a government using public money to create what has to be the most extraordinary transformation of any society in human history. India, massive scale. Europe, massive scale. Where are we? On the fringe. So, of course, we want to be a leading edge. But how do you become a leading edge if you can only afford so much and you've cut yourself off 
from the technological base and the funding of Europe. You can't. So to that extent, it's a delusion. Immigration. There is no solution to British immigration that does not, in fact, involve Europe, because they are coming from outside Europe into Europe and then from France into this country. And the only credible solution is a twofold solution. One is to put a, a wall, a ring, a protective barrier around Europe, and that would be seen by many people as an immoral reaction to poverty outside. But if you were to couple it with a martial aid program of the sort the Americans did after the Second World War, and to come to deals with the countries from which the immigrants are coming to create the conditions that persuade them to stay there, then you have an effective policy and you have a moral policy. So we aren't part of that, and we are talking about stopping the boats. They'll find another way. And then environmental policy. I mean, we could debate how serious climate change is. I personally am not going to risk being uh, on the wrong side of this issue. Um, so, do you think this country can solve the climate change issue? Well, inside Europe, with 400 million of us, we can do something. We can talk as equals to the big power blocks. Outside, do people really listen? So, uh, th th what we've done is to create an, a separate unity called the United Kingdom outside one of the power blocks that is bound to affect us in, in numerous ways. And what I see is an empty chair in one of the major power blocks of the country. And it came home to me the other day, I was on holiday with my wife in Cyprus. And I suddenly realized that Cyprus is closer to the center of power in Europe than we are. That's unforgivable. Yeah. In this post-COVID world, uh, which we're now experiencing, uh, has there to be a changing role for government? Because you mentioned about the Americans, and we have the IRA Act, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, by the Biden administration, which is <clears throat> putting in over a trillion dollars in grants and tax deductible allowances uh, for that. Do we risk it and really been left behind? And is it too late? How do we get on that bandwagon? But this is how it always was. As I explained to you, the Star Wars programme was exactly this in a different context. Uh, the Europeans are going to respond on a similar scale uh, in the compatible with the European economy to what uh, President Biden and the Chinese are already doing. And we have cut ourselves off. And so what is the solution? There is only one solution, and that is to rejoin the single market. And the quicker we realize that, and the quicker we do it, it can't be done tomorrow, and it can't be done easily, but it must be the purpose. And if there is one criticism of the body politics in this country today, is that no serious politician is arguing this case. And I know why because they're terrified of the populist voice and the effect on the populist votes of in, in an election context. So there is a disconnect between the truth, the reality of Britain's increasingly disconnected posture in the world and the ability to garner votes of people who think that Brexit was part of the problem. Okay, so we have to be part of a bigger fraternity. We are, we are part of Europe. We can either seek to influence it or let them make the decisions which will affect us in any way. We have been for a thousand years and more part of Europe. Mm -hmm. And your experience uh, at the end of the Second World War, the Marshall Plan, as you thought, you and your contemporaries, it seemed as if that experience it, it infiltrated your very political and human being of the Second World War. Is that... It, Correct. Uh, you, you absolutely put your finger on the e epicenter of my political faith. I helped to start, as an undergraduate at Oxford, a, 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 a sub-unit of the local Conservative Party. It's called the Blue Ribbon Club. 
blue cover, three interlocking circles in gold. United States, Commonwealth, Europe. And I was introduced to politics. At the time, the Conservatives were leading the vision of Europe. And it was a very simple vision. It must never happen again. It started with the Schumann plan, inspired by the men and women from the resistance movements and the uh, prisoner of war camps who'd seen three wars in Germany and France in three quarters of a century. It must never happen again. And the Conservatives developed Churchill's great speech. We must create a kind of United States of Europe. He didn't say they must create, he said we must create. And then, of course, the great winds of change speech by Harold Macmillan, explaining that the end of empire had come. We could no longer afford, even if we wanted, to maintain that hegemony over such a large part of the world surface. Ted Heath secured our accession. And my generation saw that as a vision, as compatible with the concept of humanity and peaceful conditions in a way that history had denied so many people. And, and my party has blown it. And it is unforgivable and it must be reversed. Well, Lord Hesseltine, can I thank you for the privilege of this conversation with you, but your resilience, your openness, your honesty, uh, and your relevance to today's society is every bit as fresh as it was from day one. So it's been a real pleasure for me, and thank you very much. It's been a privilege, my Lord Speaker. Thank you. It's really brilliant, it is. And I genuinely say that, you're 90, for God's sake, you know, when are you going to stop? Yeah. Tell me you're not going to stop. You're not going to stop me. <laughs> no. no one's going to stop me. <laughs> Buggers. Quite right, so.